good evening, good morning, um, wherever you're joining us from. Um, welcome to our third uh, web series on sustainable farming. We should be starting shortly in about two minutes. Please feel free to let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, give us your name, your organization, or the country where you're joining from, and what interests you most a lot about sustainable farming. Our participants online that we will be starting shortly, uh, feel free to let us know where you're joining in from. I see Phil Maloney uh, already um, touching best. Welcome to our third web series. We should be starting shortly, actually at the top of uh, the next minute. We've got an a fantastic panel of experts uh, that who will be sharing with us some of the nuggets around sustainable farming. And we are also um, keen on hearing some of your views as well in the chat, uh, as we usually do. So welcome to our third web series on sustainable farming. I'm happy to see that we have colleagues and folks from all over Australia, Kenya, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Uganda, Tanzania, you know, keep coming, keep the messages coming. This is our third web series of sustainable farming with a, a, a good focus and lens on the farmer. So we will be carrying forward the lessons from previous, but to do this, as usual, we've got an excellent panel uh, of people from all over. We've got Dr. Onfunke Kofi from Ghana. If you can please put your camera on. My panel, please put your camera. I will do some very quick intro, but we will do the detailed introductions as you come to speak. So if I can have my panel put their cameras on, uh, that is Dr. Kofi Olumfuke from Nigeria, from Ghana, sorry, uh, my apologies. We've got Mr. Z Ziwedi Jerry from Malawi. Uh, yes, over there. We've got Dr. Asefa Tofu. Um, I think your camera is slightly low if you can just Tilt your camera a little bit. We're only seeing the top of your head. Excellent. From Ethiopia, we've got Dr. Monica Nderitu from Kenya. Welcome, Monica. And we've got Dr. Pascal Kambuthu also from Kenya. Dr. Pascal, um, I don't see you, but we will be coming back to you. Uh, I think you could be on the other link. I think I saw you posts are not, uh, we will try and make that change. But uh, without uh, further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to our third web series. Um, as you all know, we've had quite a journey landing to the farmer edition, but what keeps on coming through is that the increasing risk of climate change has been recognized by all participants uh, across our web series and the urgency to adapt, mitigate and build resilience was a common call across all of us. So with the increasing population and the increasing demand for food, we cannot shy away from the fact that climate change is calling for diversification and efficient use of our resources. And to digest this further, I really have a team of experts that will be speaking to us about the experiences. We've got farmers on the panel, we've got uh, people that also are passionate about farming, so we will be hearing right from the heart. And to set the tone as usual, allow me to introduce none other than Dr. Telahun Amedi, who is the Head of Resilience, Climate and Soils at the Alliance for Green Revolution. Um, I, I don't think I need to introduce uh, Dr. Amedi any further. Uh, he brings passion, expertise, and uh, networks to this conversation. Uh, Telaun, your camera, yeah, please. And he will be giving us, as usual, uh, the keynote to which the speakers will then be uh, elucidating further as we begin to understand what this all means to our smallholder farmer. Dr. Amedi, welcome to the web series. Thank you very much. Uh, do you see my slides? Yes, if you can put them on. Yes, I will. Correct. Good, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, thank you again for joining us in this uh, webinar. Um, and the title of uh, the current um, webinar is Farmers' Practice and Choices Related uh, to Sustainable Farming. I have, uh, I'm not, I have included a grass vision in the last two webinars. I will not talk about much today. 
but I just wanted to mention our vision, which is really inclusive agriculture transformation to empower farmers to strengthen private sector, but also to create uh, you know set capacity to make things happen on the ground. Uh, I also presented this slide uh, for those who have participated in the last webinar. Why should we do sustainable farming? Uh, I think we all agree that we have seen a low productivity, even after applying input almost in, a, in the context, in almost every in the continent, and partly because of also increasing the risk of climate change. Uh, so we need to strengthen our farmers' capacity, the share capacity. Most of our farming is in uh, really highly vulnerable systems, where largely made based. So in its diversification, in its improved resources efficiency, we have an increasing population and without sustainable intensification and resource management, you know, it may lead to expanding agriculture to protected areas, to forests, causing up, you know, deforestation, drying of wetlands, but also in areas where we have already good yields, you know, we cannot maintain the, the yield level unless we manage our sources better. Uh, and we, you know, our governments are already investing in most countries on inputs, but unless we manage our resources better and predict our weather and respond to it, our terms for investment will also remain low. And in Agra, we have been working a lot in um, terms of moving technology and practices, inputs to the farmers field. And we consider them as um, entry points to you know, move to more complex and array issues. But we realize that you know, resources management, integrated management of landscapes would really bring about or play more and multiple roles in terms of climate change mitigation, increasing productivity and profitability, but also in the regreening of our system. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I talked about this last time. But what came out of the last two webinars, so webinar one and webinar two, a lot um, has been suggested and discussed, but I feel that only about seven points. One is really we cannot compromise food security, resilience, and sustainability over the long term because we have to feed our people. The second thing which came out was that in the African farming systems are diverse that are prone to multiple risks. We have low response capacity. So we need okay. a really unique, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Unique uh, trajectory, uh, which is about really targeting the right technology and practice to the right farmers and teams. We also say that, you know, um, the African continent, con continent resource degradation is severe. Uh, there's a lot of mining of really water, of nutrients. So there's a need for conscious and the judicious use of external input uh, because of the, really the century long mining of nutrients. And we also have this, uh, you know, there are so many parallel and competing um, ideologies. Um, the, you know, sustainable farming, Regenerative agriculture, sustainable intensification, agroecology. But at the end of the day, we have you know, a common goal, which is really a middle ground to improve the, the farmers and their systems in the continent. So we have to work together and uh, consider the middle ground. That was really the major outcome, which came from the first uh, webinar supported by, you know, really outcomes of the second webinar. In the second webinar, I think the major outcomes were really in terms of identifying best practices, which are tested, which are evaluated within the continent, but are not reaching farmers at a scale. So there are good practices, but what do we do with them? And it's the head is farmer. The second thing which comes out is that, you know, there's still lack of capacity, capacity in the extension, capacity in the research, capacity in the extension system to promote and institutionalize this context-specific sustainable farming practice. That's another 
key outcome of the first, the second uh, webinar. And uh, most importantly, you know, uh, the second webinar also emphasizes the need for government to provide incentives to mainstream nature positive agriculture, while donors, financial institutions consider integrating the agroecological practices into their investments and plans. I may have missed um, more, but uh, these are really the, the key messages that came out of this uh, webinar. So now, uh, in the second, in the third webinar now, what we'd like to, to see, and where I think we will get uh, contributions from our colleagues in the panel, will be one, you know, to present the views and the practical experiences of farmers, uh, including Mr. Rehobos, uh, which really demonstrates that change is possible, but also their organizations and all our partners, and what do we do? and how have they managed to help farmers make things happen on the ground. But also we are very keen to create a platform for scaling up these complex and other interventions. So really, how do we take it forward? We, we have this insight. How do we pack them so that they reach to farmers and to landscapes at a scale? To, from you know, farms and landscapes to more districts, more countries, and region-wide in the country. That's really the major objective of today's webinar. Now, uh, when it comes to discriminating and scaling, uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of insight from our own perspective. I think we all agree that there are technologies and practices which are working at the research environment, which are also working under smaller you know, villages and landscapes, but we don't see them reaching more communities. Uh, and and at part of it's because we fail to target, we fail to bring in complementary practices, but also we fail to appreciate diversity in our systems and landscape. Even the recommendations we make, they are not matching the resource based of farmers. You know, consider, for example, you know, uh, fertilizer use in the farmer's capacity to respond. Or consider conservation agriculture, lack of biomass uh, because of competing uses. But also, you know, the preconditions for adoption in terms of market, market infrastructure, in terms of value addition, in terms of policies and incentives for farmers to adapt them. And, and I think predominantly also top down approaches, which really a type of like one size fits all type of principles while we, we appreciate the diversity, even within countries, even within industries, uh, and, and failing to identify critical entry points. You know, farmers are still about immediate benefits while they appreciate also long-term benefits. So they are operating in complex, risky environments. Um, and, and then talk about really scaling that framework just, uh, just to be to more to you, uh, to reach about impact, you know, those approaches which go only with technology, they, they have very limited impact. But if you go with targeting, you improve your chance of reaching more farmers. But if we, you know, combine appropriate technologies with good extension, with good policy support and incentives, you know, we can reach farmers in multiple countries along different institutions and systems. So, uh, I also, we, we also ask really, how can we make impact at scale, uh, particularly with resource management type of long-term investments, which are knowledge intensive and are really requiring investment. So I want to divide, you know, arbitrarily divide the, the, the type of innovation into two. One more of input-oriented one, which can be taken with the spring service delivery. And, and we have been working in Agra with private sector-led extension, like the village-based advisory, where we're able to reach millions of farmers 
uh, particularly in places where we facilitate the last mile delivery, we uh, input output markets. But in general, we, we know that you know, inputs which bring about tangible products and services uh, which farmers can own, like seeds, for example, which can be transported, stored, you know, which uh, you know have our literacy can be tested anywhere. It doesn't require more labor, which are low cost and people are not feeling about risk. But also, uh, uh, you know, uh, those which are easily transferable, you know, from village to village, so farmers can, you know, use them, transport them from their village to their kinship, 100 kilometers away, and they see their work. But also coming from multiple sources and multiple actors with immediate income, I mean, impact. These are relatively successful to move from one to another. Of course, we have still a lot to work on. But uh, like this one, so really, you can't demonstrate overnight uh, in a season how that variety can you know, perform in a certain location. But we, we are challenged with really promoting nature-based solutions, which are complex, which are a mix of technologies, with variety, soil fertility management, water management, agroforestry, you know, landscape. So it's not one technology, it's a mix of technologies, and that mix varies from location to location, from system to system, and they are usually knowledge intensive. So not only the technology, but the knowledge has to go along. They are mostly labor intensive and high cost, um, and, and need really capacity building and follow up. So you cannot do it in one go. And uh, there's a need to really support farmers and support the extension at the scale. Uh, but also, you know, we have to aware, be aware that there is no immediate incentive for farmers to adapt the rent. So they have to link it, they have to be linked with incentives. Like, as I said, in three points, good variety, for example, uh, a responsive, uh, you know, nutritious fruit, uh, that type of immediate incentive. And these are usually also less, attra less attractive for policymakers because they cannot show impact, you know, in the short term. We see the kind of millions of farmers, you know, uh, there are policymakers who even ask multiplication of, uh, of seeds during the election period so that they demonstrate. But uh, you cannot do that with, with this knowledge intensive uh, practices, like these ones where you have to put lots of, you know, interventions together. The physical structures, ubiquity really, these blue points are what are the seed points along with truth, three samples. So these are, time-taking processes that need sustainable investment and engagement. Um, yeah, show you a bit of, you know, the response from, from farmers' perspective uh, in terms of adoption, you know, you could see these are feedbacks we, we received from thousand Ethiopia, whereby farmers, when we ask farmers, why are you not adopting them? The major one is cost, you know, high cost. I don't get enough information about them, you know, so it's like a one-time engagement. I want to make sure that it works, you know, and they want others to try it before themselves are trying it. These are like the reasons why they reject. And if you compare which type of inter interventions are adopted, the knowledge-based ones, for example, nutrition, are less adopted compared to those input-oriented ones which can be, you know, taken to scale. Uh, but also, you know, are having access from the extension, you know, about the information from the, the service providers. You can see even in countries where you have a huge uh, density of extension service, when you ask them where did you get your market information, about 50% of the people say, you know, I got it from other farmers. So the extension services, you know, they are there, but the officers were not good enough to transfer that information. To, to farmers. So there's a lot of work to be done to support farmers to adapt technology. And this is probably another important perspective. When we ask them, you know, what are your criteria for adopting a technology, particularly a variety? You see there, you know, about 90, 96 to 97% of them, they are saying, you know, better say, uh, good appearance for, for market or convenient for cooking. 
those those which are attributed to risk to resilience like disease resistance drought resistance early maturity you know they were not the major criteria for this farmers so how do we make sure that these are also considered by farmers as major criteria you know in choosing techniques and practices and uh, i have a, a 10 pack um, uh, which i will not go to details because of time constraints, but I just want to, do, to demonstrate to you the 10 commandments for, I mean, commandment for setting up the solution. One uh, from our really uh, the research and development perspective, one to adapt really this complex nature-based solution, sustainable farm solution, is really to enhance farmer innovation, to make sure that farmers assess what they have, compared to other farmers, you provide them options, they try out the best innovation, and they adopt it. So really, a fast-year fa farmer innovation was found to be very successful. So really, creating a social network of diffusion. So farmers nearby try out one less from the other and take it to scale, and, and also get access into services. You know, when you have like neighboring farmers, in mass are testing it, and there will be more interest from the investment, from investors, from the exchange, from the government. So clustering that approach really plays a very important role. But also using these small parts of technology so that people take them to their villages and, and test them. If they like them, they'll come back to buy it uh, and multiply it to scale. But also, you know, as the, the farmer from Burkina Faso showed, really capitalizing on DGS knowledge, on DGS practices, and building on adaptive capacity of these innovations. Of course, we all know that, you know, all this has to bring money. So linking to farmer opportunities, but also linking, you know, what's happening in the farms with what's happening in the landscape for collective benefits of communities and promoting more linked technologies. When you talk about linked, you know, which are going together, for example, a conservation, soil conservation with a stabilizer which can be for fodder or a fruit tree which, is, which can minimize erosion. So that type of combination of technologies which bring about multiple benefits of both uh, you know, productivity, uh, food, uh, you know, product for market, but also you know, protecting the ecosystem. And, and, and also really bringing in those which bring about social benefits and minimizing you know, conflict, for example, you know, which can compensate for trade of the farmer ha is having a technology which is helping other farmers. You know, you will create, create tension. So making sure that what we bring in is not bringing really conflict and trade off, rather uh, bringing com complementary benefits. And for all that, of course, improved coordination, you know, help farmers to, to create platforms and, and other access can, to support farmers, but also to create, you know, market opportunities using like, you know, for example, um, you know, agri services, uh, market opportunities like agro dealers, all that has to play a role in bringing these uh, innovations together. Sure, I, I stop here. Thank you very much for Thank you very much, Dr. Amedi, for those very good uh, words of wisdom. Um, I think I'm uh, hearing from Zanu and uh, Lynette, I think there were audio challenges um, and we will be able to share the recording after. Um, so please bear with us uh, with that co complication. Uh, so we, we do uh, acknowledge that feedback and thank you Telahun for bringing all these things together. I do like your reference to the 10 commandments. And I wanted to, I was trying to narrow them down to, to my simple human mind and say, how do I reduce them to four? And I created mm -hmm. a model, uh, which uh, probably some marketers would know called IDA which is uh, clustering all the actions under awareness in the first mm -hmm. air, the actions under creating interest into the I, and then desire into the D, and then action 
into the air. So Ida could be a nice way of scaling down the 10 Excellent. commandments for ease of usage, but thank you very much. And that said, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Kofi Olunfuke, uh, who is uh, the Regional Representative uh, West Africa for International Water Management Institute. Uh, Dr. Kofi, if you can put your camera on so that I can read your very excellent CV uh, while uh, your camera is on. Um, thank you very much. So um, as you know, she brings over 20 years of research experience uh, and organizational and leadership experience informing both policy and practice. Uh, she holds a PhD degree in soil science, but also has a master's degree in business management. She is such an incredible author, having published over a hundred articles in areas of water, sanitation, and sustainable agriculture. And like in the previous webinars, we did agree that these are solution provision series. Uh, so based on what you've had at Telahun uh, put out there, you know, what are some of the solutions you'd like to, to bring to the table so that we can as well emulate farmer Yakobo in stepping forward and creating African solutions for our African problems. Thank you and welcome Dr. Kofi. Thank you very much for introducing me. And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share some of our experiences from the International Water Management Institute. Uh, so IMI is uh, part of the CGL system organization for those who may not know. And we are looking at uh, water solutions for sustainable development. So we're looking at different aspects of water. So this is just part of the several things that we, we work on. So I'll be speaking with us on the resource recovery and reuse solutions to close water and not trying to lose in urbanizing areas. Okay. So the challenge that we try to address here is uh, uh, it's related to some of those challenges that uh, uh, Dr. Tilangu mentioned earlier on, uh, in particular the challenges around population growth and rapid urban growth, which is, is very common in, in Africa. It's particularly challenging resource flows, nutrient flows, water flows, energy flows, and the related waste management and sanitation challenges that come with that. Uh, urban areas account for 75% of the world's natural resource uh, consumption and produce over 50% of the global waste. And just two to 3% of our land surface. So it's, it's, it's very important that we look at what is coming up in, in this uh, um, area and see how we can uh, manage to ensure sustainable farming systems. Without actually finding a way to recover these resources, the organic waste accumulates in cities, in many of our cities. And we know how challenging it is for our municipal governments and, 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 and to, to manage generally the accumulating waste in, in our countries. Uh, for example, if you look at solid waste management and uh, across different regions in the world, you find out that quite a lot uh, is, remain untreated in developing countries. Particularly in our sub-Saharan Africa, we have close to 70% that, that end up in open dumps, as just as close as what we have in South Asia. So when you take South Asia and Africa, we have, we're, we're kind of operating at the same level. Quite a lot of our waste uh, end up in, in open dump and not managed. Uh, apart from solid waste in the in the urban areas, we're looking at wastewater. It's, an, it's another challenge. Uh, globally, uh, we have about 30 million hectares of irrigated crop plants that are exposed to poorly treated or untreated urban wastewater. And that area of land is like in some countries that is just like the area of the size of of a of, of a whole country. So and, and less than one million hectares actually receive treated wastewater. So it's very common to find uh, farmers growing and using polluted water or partially, uh, partially treated water, uh, particularly in our countries where we have open drainage systems. 
and we we just everything goes from runoff to black water to gray water everything goes into in the, in the development drainage system our farmers use it for irrigation so some of the food that products that we we eat come from such a practice uh, apart from that there's also the whole uh, issue around excreta trickle sludge where we already in africa we have less than i mean actually not only in africa many places in in asia as well but since Africa is our home, and that's where we are, why we are here, we have less than 10% of the waste water in, in the, that actually uh, are connected to central sewage system. So we find out that eventually you, you need trucks to go to the households, to public toilets, to, to the sludge, to take away the, the, this kind of substance and find somewhere to dump it. If we are fortunate enough to have treatment facilities, then it's there. Otherwise, it, it ends up in open drains. Uh, 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 it, it's very interesting as we see that quite a lot of resources are inside this. You see different colors. Here is partially decomposed, and this one is freshly not so decomposed, very high in nitrogen. But then, of course, it's, it's, it's out there, wasted. So it's very important to begin to think about how do we recover these resources and, and bring it back into the system where we need it, in the soils where that are depleted, and where we, we need the biosolids, the organic actually, uh, which cannot be provided by our chemical fertilizer. That is, we need the organics to help. The interesting thing is also in, in, in urbanizing areas, we have quite a lot of agricultural practices going on that we intensively, where we have crops like vegetables, like lettuce can be grown up to seven, eight times intensively on a piece of land uh, for many years. Uh, and this serves as a good source of nutrition, but then such a practice in, in to be sustainable in Africa because of our thin organic matter level, because of the high degradation and all that, we will see that we need more than nutrients that is supplied from fertilizer. We need other sources of um, nutrients. We need water, we need all that to be able to capitalize on that system. So uh, resource recovery and reuse offers a menu of value propositions. Sorry, there's a background noise from my house. Um, we, we can see that with the right technology and business model, we, we, we can uh, re recover nutrients, we can recover organic matter, we can recover water for, for agriculture to contribute to sustainable farming. And there are different uh, uh, options. There are different values. Recovery uh, from recovery of wastewater and biosolids, you know, from surface water to get recovering water for irrigation, uh, nutrients and organic matter that we can use. And that we avoid eutrophication. It will avoid the pollution of the water bodies, and whereas it can help us to actually improve on our, on our soil resource base. Um, we can also recover some of these biosolids materials also for fish feed production uh, or biofuel uh, and, and all that. Uh, we can recover carbon that can be used for other purposes or water that can be used for industry or for food processing and, and, and all that. So quite a variety of solutions uh, available with the right business model. So we have uh, at, at EMEA, EMEA partners, we have worked quite a lot on, on some of this and come up with uh, different types of business models that can really help SMEs to take some of these solutions to scale. Um, in, in this publication here, you will see it's a catalog of business models for more than maybe one, 150 cases that shows how we can recover some of these resources from waste. And, and how we can use it uh, in different mix to recover operation costs, or at least to some extent, maybe some, some part of capital costs and, uh, and some kind of subsidy may also be required. So let me just give two or three cases, uh, examples before I, I close. Uh, first, it's about wastewater irrigation. Because we have, usually we don't, we don't have a sewer system that is uh, where we have a lot of water in our borders. So most of the water, as I mentioned earlier, is coming in the open drainage system. 
and it's risky. There are technologies and solutions that have been developed that can help us to actually minimize the health risk that is associated with using such water, if that is the only option resource that is available for us to use to enhance sustainable farming. I, I realize that one of the things that uh, Tlaon talked about is about water management. So there are solutions, there are low cost options that can reduce consumer health risk. But most of, this, most, of, most of the time, these solutions have to be combined together on farm, on, at the farm level, the irrigation treatments, you know, uh, to, to ensure irrigation, the right irrigation practice and some on farm water treatment, simple long water treatment technologies that can help improve the quality of water that is used right at the farm level. Uh, and uh, apart from the farm, post-production, post-harvest handling, where sometimes food products are recontaminated as well. There are also other forms of simple practices that can be used uh, up to the table, from farm to, to the table, to bring in uh, uh, improvements in the quality of the produce so that at the end, there's no health risk associated. And that allows us to use, to reuse or recycle water that is uh, produced you know, in, the, in the urban areas and help us to maximize the resource, uh, that kind of resource. Not only will it give us water, and some of them can actually give us some nutrients. So there are international guidelines that have been developed to guide such practice. There's WHO guidelines for the reusing, there's FAO guidelines, and quite a lot of other materials that have been developed that can be uh, help us to, to, to farmers to actually use some of these things. The only thing is that sometimes because we have to combine in, in, in the in the recess to be make it to make it very effective, farmers will have to kind of combine two or three um, uh, risk minimizing minimizing options, uh, for them to actually go into that, we need some kind of incentives or behavioral change. Uh, that's what we have realized in, in, in some of our, the work that we have done. But beyond that, with uh, adequate training and support farmers can adopt some of those simple methods. The second example is turning waste to fertilizer. And we have an example that we have done in, in Ghana, which we actually have also replicated somewhere in, in, Asia, in South Asia. That is uh, converting waste to fertilizer. We, there's, there's a fertilizer product that has been developed and has been actually approved by the government to for commercialization for distribution in Ghana. So it's, we call it Fortifa. Now, through uh, the, our work we have done together with partners, we have come up with different fortified formulations and have been able to come up with uh, the commercialization through an, a, a PPP kind of business model because you know it's coming from the waste and the waste is in the public domain in terms of management, but then they need the private sector. So what we have done is to work together with the private sector and the public entities to identify opportunities to actually scale this. And so it's, it's been, it's been um, uh, commercialized in Ghana by uh, a company, private uh, waste management company. So it's part of the overall waste management, waste management uh, 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 strategy in, in some cities. Uh, we, we've done quite some work, you know, uh, working with farmers in different agroecological zones and to look at their, their perception about it. Generally, they are, they are very fine with it. Of course, there are limitations, but particularly if we're beginning to think about um, export markets where there are some restrictions with uh, waste-based uh, fertilizer, but for local consumption and regional consumption and, and with adequate um, uh, guides, it, when it's well produced, it, it's quite good, it provides the organic matter that is required to improve nutrients. Not only does it improve the so organic matter, but also improve water use efficiency and overall crop physiology that can help in that normally help increase uh, crop yield. And the last one is also like converting wastewater for green fish in, in landlocked areas where people do not have as, access to maybe freshwater resources and there are opportunities to use um, treated wastewater, treated wastewater for specific uh, uh, production. We can use it for fish production, we can use it to produce uh, 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 feeds actually that can also feed into the livestock industry. So we also have example like that in, in Kumasi, Ghana, where 
uh, we, we, we have been able to work uh, with a private entity. Again, another PPP arrangement are scaling this kind of innovation. The limitation with this is that it's not in every place that you can actually get a treated facility where we have treat, treated wastewater. So that we, where it is available, we can still use the resources that's available or with, with the treated wastewater for green fish. Uh, in this case, you use it to grow fingerlings, not that, uh, and, uh, to, and, and to produce fingerlings. So it's not, uh, and then the fingerlings is now used good water, more, more quality, better quality water is now used to, to grow the fish to, to harvest. Um, so those are some two examples, uh, three examples I, I want to sh I want to uh, I want to in, uh, share with us, and most of these have been documented. We have a, a series of, of uh, simple, easy to read, not really so focused on journal. Uh, uh, we call it resource recovery and reuse series that can be available and easily downloadable in our in our on our website. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kofi, for that very good articulation. And I really love the fact that you brought solutions uh, with the good examples around the PPPs on Fortifier, um, but also that you've got over 141 other low cost options. So I think some of the questions coming through is how do we learn from the PPP success to be able to scale a lot more of those. And uh, Phil Madoni does say they also have a urine for fertilizer um, model in Uganda. Uh, and I think he has posted that in the chat as well. So um, to our participants that are struggling to listen to us, we really are working behind the scene to make sure we fix the audio. Our French speakers, we've also noted the challenge on translation. We are uh, working on that, but I would like to note uh, some of the additional participants that have joined us from Washington, D.C., Hans Muzora from USAID, we recognize your presence. Our colleagues from uh, and our partners from FCDO and IKEA, welcome. Uh, we're also seeing colleagues coming from Italy and Kigali. I'm recognizing the countries that I hadn't mentioned earlier. Thank you so much for all the feedback that is coming through. Keep it coming uh, and we will come back to, to Dr. Kofi later on uh, in, in the conversation. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to our third, third web series on sustainable farming. At this juncture, allow me to introduce our second uh, panelist, uh, who is none other than Mr. Zwedi Jerry, who's the managing director Total Land Care, all the way from Malawi. Uh, Mr. Zwedi, if you can put your camera on as I introduce you. Um, um, Dr. Kofi, do you like to pull down your presentation, please? Ah, excellent, great. Yes, yeah, so uh, Zwedi, uh, you're welcome. Um, he brings over 30 years working with rural communities uh, in partnerships with government and private sector. So again, you do speak to the PPP earlier on I mentioned. He is very keen on resource management and conflict solutioning in land use soil conservation, agroforestry interventions, community empowerment, to mention but a few. Uh, Mr. Zwedi, uh, you're welcome to the web series. Uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. I, uh, I'm trying to share my, uh, I hope you can see that. Yes, we do see that. Okay. Um, sorry, I need to. You can go up. Sorry. Okay, you started at the bottom. That's okay. Yeah, yeah let me. Let me just. I encourage start. our participants that our hashtag is uh, Elevate Agriculture. Feel free to share. Um, any of the wisdom you have out there, tell us what resonates with you. And as we allow Dr. Zwedi to set himself up, I just wanted to read a few of the messages that came from, from our participants about what they learned on the earlier video um, from Farmer Yakoba. Um, 
I did see some people saying it was an inspired video from an experienced man. Uh, some are saying it's protection and restoration of soil. Others are saying there's local knowledge and respect for the environment, show by doing. Very, very good messages coming out there. Please keep the messages coming. I'll keep a very close eye on your comments, uh, as well as any questions for the panel. Over to you, Mr. Zwedi, when you're ready. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I'm trying to, uh, to get it, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna, uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Um, I think here it's, uh, it's 4.30 in, in Malawi. Um, my presentation, um, uh, I've tried with building resilience to climate change, and I'm going to focus on Malawi, so a case study for Malawi. Opportunities for, um, opportunities for upscaling conservation agriculture. So this is my presentation. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, I will not talk about total land care uh, because of uh, in the interest of time. I'm just uh, going straight into the presentation. So we are talking about conservation agriculture and uh, in our case, the message is quite clear. So what we're saying is that we need to, to as much as possible to get rid of ridging. So we need to make small planting holes with a deep stick or use a hand hole, uh, which is an old practice as most of us know. Uh, um, this, this practice was there be, before the colonialists uh, came to this part of Africa. Um, but we also emphasize retaining crop residues, producing city, as well as the diversity of crops through rotations where farmers you know, can afford to, if they have enough land or through intercropping. Um, I, I also wanted to also to emphasize the state of the problem, you know, the land degradation problem in the context of Malawi. Um, you know, we have promoted region for the past, you know, seven decades, promoting region, contour region. Uh, but the, I think all of us know that there is no evidence that uh, this uh, region is really reducing runoff erosion. Uh, but to the contrary, evidence uh, show that the, or shows that rainfall is actually channeled into the compacted furrows when it's raining. So there is, uh, it's clear that region actually contributes uh, towards runoff. And as, uh, also we can see that uh, uh, in, in 1992, the World Bank produced a report which showed that the, in Malawi, you know, uh, in terms of soil erosion, we are, we are talking about 20 tons. So that was what was recorded in 1992. Uh, um, in, in 2019, uh, FAO did also study, and the, it was found that the, the soil loss, loss of topsoil, averaged about 29 tons per hectare. So you can see over that period that the, you know, despite all these measures of you know region putting regions on the contour line and the other measures, the region has not decreased over time. Um, also, I think you agree with me that region is also contributing seriously towards the soil organic uh, carbon mineralization. I think this is a, a very important topic that maybe we could discuss in future, uh, particularly also in line with the recent uh, IPPCC reports. Uh, uh, regarding global uh, warming. And I think uh, farming, as we know, is contributing drastically uh, quite a lot towards uh, emission of green gas, green, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these are some of the uh, effects of region, as you can see there. Uh, there's water being channeled from the regions and forming those gardens, just emphasizing the, the problem of region. This is one of the problems you can see. It's a lot of soil being moved around. 
Um, we did a study. So we, see, we found that with an average ridge spacing of 90 centimeters, uh, this means constructing 11 kilometers of ridges per hectare every year, equal to moving around 600 tons of soil. So it's, it's quite a problem, the uh, region, as we can see. Um, so with regard to total land care, uh, promoting this intervention, uh, we are uh, emphasizing minimum soil disturbance, good soil cover, rotations, and intercrops. But also very important is the complementary practices, okay, where we integrate other good uh, practices such as uh, uh, using quality seed or even using, uh, to some extent, uh, with better management, organic fertilizers, or uh, agroforest or farmer managed natural uh, regeneration, with the headless to control runoff, uh, as well as the, you know, um, to, to reduce weed uh, using herbicides to some extent to reduce weed uh, competition. But uh, uh, this, this part is also we are uh, discouraging because of the other environmental uh, impacts related to it. This is just a scheme to explain the, uh, our approach. Um, this is what I described, the uh, area one simple method of planting, especially on smallholder farmers' fields, using a double stick. Uh, this is also a farmer, farmer's fields in an area with Fedebia Abida with the crop residues on the surface. Uh, another uh, picture there showing, you know, maize planted uh, in a sea field with the uh, uh, crop residues left on the surface. Also, this system, because previously, uh, uh, most people believe that we would only do CA with, with maize, but now we've demonstrated that with uh, beans as well as groundnuts, you can have very high yields, as I will show, I will, I will show some of the examples, uh, using uh, conservation agriculture. This is cowpeas. So on the left, you can see that uh, uh, the maize there is inter, inter, uh, planted with uh, cowpeas, and then the the, once the maize is harvested, then you are left with the, the copies on, on in the field. And then the, I mean, you can see here, you know, there are no weeds there. Uh, so the copies is taken over and it's still green. Um, uh, it will be ready maybe at, at this stage, maybe in two months. So that's when farmers will be harvesting. So there are many benefits there, uh, control, controlling weeds, uh, but also, uh, controlling the soil from the heat, and then you have a good crop of cowpeas. So what we did was, uh, because the, the problem we had was that uh, most people didn't believe that the conservation agriculture is working in Malawi, because we've been used to region for, as I indicated, for the past 70 years. So in partnership with CIMIT and uh, uh, the Minister of Agriculture through Machira IDD, we ran some long-term trials, on-farm trials, spanning a period of about 12, 13 years. And uh, we looked at uh, conventional ridge tilling of mills uh, using a handhold, and then we compared also with the conservation uh, agriculture maize soil crop, and then conservation agriculture maize plus cowpea and pigeon pea intercrop. Some of the results which which we got, um, you can see there that uh, uh, with the conventional tillage at the bottom there in red, there with the conservation agriculture maize only uh, in blue, and then the conservation agriculture with the legume, it, you can see these two are still superior uh, on in a CA field compared to the conventional practice of region. Um, also, you can see there, um, 12, year, 12 years of trial um, in different locations, different agroecological zones, um, and also demonstrating that if you see there, uh, in 2012, we had a, a very bad year. It was a dry year, as you can see. Uh, you can see here, this, this year, 
So we, we just want to show you that this year was a bad year, but you can see that uh, even in a, in a lower rainfall year, um, the conservation agriculture, you know, with maize as well as the intercrop, uh, outperformed the uh, conversion or ridge tillage uh, across all those uh, all those sites. Um, also, here you can see the gross margins. So the gross margins are also uh, much better with the CA uh, compared with the the conventional uh, or conventional tillage. We 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 say that you know interviewed farmers. What what are the factors driving adoption? And uh, one of the um, factors that was coming up uh, in most of the locations where we did this conduct this uh, interview was that uh, CA uh, increases food security and crop yields, and then also very important for farmers reducing labor costs, uh, reducing the effects of dry spells, soil improvement. 38% and increased incomes. So those were some of the factors that he, uh, contributed towards uh, increasing adoption in the areas where we were uh, working. We also looked at some of the factors that actually uh, uh, contribute towards uh, farmers not adopting the, the, the practice. Uh, the one that was coming up strongly was lack of information, poor understanding of CA, and also conflicting messages and approaches, uh, which is caused by the different uh, um, extension service providers, including promotion of ridges and basins, because the others were also promoting basins, which is quite labor intensive. Uh, the other reasons were limited access to inputs and, res and residues biomass, or high labor cost to collect residues, and then resistance to change. Also, we see embedded culture of region and clean fields. Others were concerns about control of weeds, because most farmers said, how can we control weeds if we are not, uh, not region? Um, you see, we started CA uh, in, Back in 2005, 2006, we, we started with priors and then farmers were adopting in the neighborhood. Uh, you can see there uh, the trend in terms of adoption of the practice. Um, these are not cumulative factor, uh, figures, but they are annual figures. Uh, but you see a peak, we, we reached a peak uh, between 2013, 14 and up to 2015 to 2016. This is more related to the fact that we had projects that time which were focusing on conservation agriculture. Uh, so again, this this is also an issue because then the the adoption seemed to relate more to projects because the project was intensive in terms of the extension support and also providing some of the uh, some of the inputs uh, to to promote the technology. What are the key challenges in the adoption of conservation agriculture? The first one is conflicting policies. So we've seen that uh, while the ministry has accepted uh, CA as a sustainable agriculture practice, but also as an important intervention to address the impact of climate change, uh, they are still, you know, also in parallel promoting conventional tillage you know, using contour lines and realigning ridges following the contour uh, marker line. So again, this is uh, an issue that has caused the problem. Uh, also, the, the issue of resistance to change. I think it's very important that we need comparing evidence as I uh, demonstrated through those trials which we conducted over the period of, uh, of 12 years. Because some of the farmers were learning uh, we use the, the trials, on-farm trials, uh, but, uh, at, you know, in parallel to use them as demonstrations so farmers could see, and we saw that some of the farmers who were neighboring those farmers involved in the trials were also on their own practicing and seeing the, the benefits of, of CA. So we need evidence-based information to really convince 
uh, everybody, including farmers and extension agents and policy makers. Delivery of inconsistent and conflicting technical messages on CA by different organizations uh, also created confusion among both extension staff and farmers. So the, sometimes the messages were incorrect, uh, in the end compromising the benefit of, of CA as a good agriculture practice. The quality of training, lack of practical knowledge on CA, highlighted the need to deliver quality training to extension staff for you know across the board, government projects and jobs. The other the other constraint was on the focus focusing on inputs because uh, even farmers and some uh, extension agents believe that you cannot do CA without inputs. So. Uh, with the, the, the merit of the practice was compromised because of, of that uh, mis misconception or misinformation. Also, I think very, very important, the membership in some of the groups, okay? Uh, the, the membership was small, so we could not, you know, we, we, we needed more uh, numbers of farmers, you know, in groups as they are learning the practice to, to reach that critical critical mass for, for us really to scale up adoption of CA. What are the actions that we need to address these challenges? We need uh, to strengthen knowledge and support for CA among stakeholders. As I've repeatedly you know, mentioned, with compelling evidence of its benefits. Okay, this is very important. So the knowledge base is very critical and the evidence. We need to develop and deliver certified training process to on, on CA for food, lead farmers, farmer food schools, extension staff from government NGOs, projects, and others who are promoting the practice. So we need to deliver you know, a good training. We need to harmonize messages among, among implementers. Uh, which is to us very clear if we want to avoid distorting the true value of CA and also to, to avoid you know, confusing extension staff and farmers. We need to harmonize. Uh, for us, what we have done also was to, to, uh, to harmonize the CA by you know, developing the national guidelines. So we have the national guidelines. We, I think also through COMESA and the, I think AU, there is this idea to have this uh, national task force on CA. So in Malawi we had the task force, but this has now, we have now formed the Sustainable Agriculture Trust to coordinate um, uh, promotion of conservation agriculture. So I have more one, one more slide, uh, Mr. Moderator, then I can finish. The, uh, the, the next, the next uh, um, action that we need is to, to promote effective community-based systems of extension. I think this also has been highlighted by the other facilitators. Also, we are looking at the uh, piloting animal and mechanized reaping services. We, we want to work with young entrepreneurs who can own uh, reaping uh, equipment and they can do this uh, tillage service, uh, which is becoming quite attractive, especially to young farmers, uh, as, a, as, a, as a good uh, also agricultural practices, but also as the uh, uh, what we call CM organization. But with the, my conclusion is that uh, farmers and change agents are still practicing or recommending the same ways of farming. Despite changing context, uh, we see that the, you know, uh, we have the soil health is getting degraded, the climate is changing, but we are doing the same things we are doing 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we are saying it's time to start, you know, adapting to uh, situations that they are changing. We need to adapt and you know apply new farming methods or appropriate methods. We need to embrace evidence-based approaches and technologies to adapt to changing times. And I think also very important is that it's about the mindset. Okay, so. If we are not changing the mindset, the mindset, we will be doing the same things, even though the situation is changing. The situation is getting worse, soils are getting degraded, but it's the same mindset, then we have a problem. And the last one is we need to prioritize women and youth 
as champions for change. I think we see that the young people are very critical to drive this thing to make a difference. So we need to use these as champions for change. So uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, Madam Moderator, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you thank very you. much, Mr. Uh, Zwede Jerry, for those very passionate deliverables. Uh, I think the chat is so full of uh, questions and comments for you. I encourage you to go in and respond to them. I cannot uh, but avoid to call out one particular one from, um, from Ewan Abed, uh, who was asking, how can you attract young people, dot com people, uh, to see a practices, especially seeing that the adoption itself was challenged soon as the programs came to a conclusion. But I guess that is why we are here. We are happy to hear from all of you on how we can make that happen. But most importantly, I think I was equally intrigued by this the messaging around how can we have one common message across sub-Saharan Africa so that we are not confusing the messages. The 49% conflicting messages looks like something that we can all come together and rally around and solve for uh, as we go ahead in pushing for uh, sustainable farming or CA, whatever you'd like to call it. So uh, at this moment, I would like to ask Dr. Asefa Tofu to please put your camera on. Uh, colleagues online, please keep the questions coming. And the comments, the panelists will be speaking to most of the questions in the chat, uh, but do continue to share your comments that are coming through. So Dr. Asefa Tofu um, is our next speaker. Um, he brings with him as well, excellent experience uh, in the area. He's a PhD in environmental management. He also has a master's degree in plant breeding from Haraya University. He is an expert in dry land development, having piloted a couple of community-based uh, regenerative interventions, uh, with a particular one I want to call out around the clean energy efficient cooking stove, but also that he has been able to receive over $2.3 million in carbon credits, uh, really implying that this can happen. He is also a proud winner of the 2020 Energy Globe Global Award, in the category of Earth, and is currently a serving member of the ADB Adaptation Benefit Mechanism, um, as well as an author of multiple publications. He does believe that the best is yet to come, and Dr. Tofu, we are waiting for the best to come from you. Welcome. Uh, you are showing us your email. Yeah, thank you. But uh, I'm trying to find out my presentation. <coughs> what happened? Okay. Um, can you share for me if you can? Okay, Angie, are you able to share? Or Dorothy, mm -hmm. are we able to share his presentation? Do we have it? Dorothy, do you have it? I don't have it. No, well. he has not. He has not sent it to me. Okay, Telahun, are you able to share? Uh, let's try and solve it. Let me introduce another speaker, Dr. Tofu, as we as you share your presentation. So, in the interest of time, uh, mm. so you can pull down your screen, and uh, we will try and solve that behind the scene. Um, my colleagues will be reaching out to you shortly to just get this done. Uh, so that said, um, a little hiccup, but we'll be coming back to Dr. Tofu shortly. Allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Monica Wangechi Deritu. Dr. Monica, if you can put your camera on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica. Um, like I mentioned, we've got a, a, you know an expert panel of speakers today, and I, I cannot uh, tire from introducing who they are. Uh, but she is a climate change and adaptation expert. She's also a lecturer, having worked in multiple countries. She brings expertise from Southern Sudan. She's worked in Somalia, keen to hear how you know, you've managed to work in Somalia and Kenya. But she's also the member of the Environmental Institute of Kenya, and will be bringing that expertise to the conversation. And interestingly, she loves nature works but also loves farming. 
Welcome, Dr. Wangechi, to the conversation. Take it away. Uh, thank I you have, so much. I uh, have the... Okay. Uh, uh, Tilaun, can you please mute? Uh, was that Dr. Tofu, you could mute. I uh, will have Dr. Monika present and we'll come back to you. Over to you, uh, Dr. Wangechi. Uh, thank you so much. I'm also trying to connect to share my screen. Uh, probably Dr. Asif could just go on. I think I'm also having an issue. With okay. Um, <laughs> no, don't worry. We are not short of presenters. I think I will be calling on now Dr. Pascal. No, um, I think no, Asafa is there. He can yeah, Dr. Asafa is ready. Yeah. Yes, so uh, I put the, the presentation of Asafa. Can you yeah. see it? Yeah, I see. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yes, no. yes, yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so over to you, Dr. Asafa. Sure. Uh, you guys listening to me? So... So are, are you listening to me? All right, okay. Yes, we, we yes, we can you. hear you. Yeah. Uh, the, the title is uh, Landscape Restoration, uh, Connecting Local Challenge with uh, Carbon Financing, which is a the specific topic for this presentation. And the outlines are indicated here. So with this outline, I will focus on the next slide. Yeah. Uh, I. As all of you know, that there are different types of landscape, particularly in Ethiopia, which is highland dominated. Uh, approximately about 88% of the total population is residing in this area, which covers about regularly about nearly about 95% of regular cropping land. You can imagine for this size or portion of the land for more than 100 million uh, people having countries. So this makes Ethiopia which demand the landscape approach, particularly to restore and move forward. Yeah, over the last decades, I think, uh, uh, according to different reports, in 2010, the Ethiopian government launched a land restoration program that aimed to double agriculture productivity, so improving uh, the management of natural resources and agricultural land. Uh, the different data are there. So currently, for the last three years, the new government is also taking a big initiative in the name of Green Legacy, and uh, close to or even more than 5 billion seedlings are being planted uh, over the last three years. So I think which has a lot of implication, given the, the landscape nature, the source of energy from hydro, and uh, more than 90% of people dependent on agriculture, making sure that the landscape is healthy, is, is thus, I think, pushing the government and everybody in this country. So in this regard, uh, some financial finance is also is needed. Uh, coming to this presentation, uh, I'll be focusing on the, on the uh, climate change, particularly on carbon finance. So I think, as most of you currently, they are mainly a green climate fund to, to support this uh, climate rich, uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation aspect, uh, which is uh, called the world's largest uh, dedicated fund helping developing countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emission and uh, to catalyze uh, flow of climate finance and uh, Investors in adaptation and the mitigation, and the fund is unique in its ability to engage directly with both the public and the private sector. So this is one of the, the global facility, or I can say one of the globally available resource uh, people can uh, countries can tap and uh, attempt to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Yeah, so with that, I think in 2000, late 2005, we are, as many of you are aware, the CDM that the Kyoto decision based CDM approach has been one of the market mechanism available uh, for the whole uh, world, particularly for developing and developing countries. For, so 
out of this um, market mechanism, that's the clean development mechanism, which is uh, afforestation and reforestation base was selected by, we selected as a world vision to pilot whether this system can work or not on the ground uh, because of uh, uh, number one, to incentivize the natural resource management. Number two, also to connect the local community with the international uh, carbon market. So this is the, the picture in 2010 from the area called Humbo. Yeah, the, other, the next one is, this is a 2014 picture from the same area. You can see not only the mountain, but also the downstream, the forest coverage is increasing uh, over time as compared to the previous year. Yeah, the next one is a 2016 picture, which I myself has been struggling to go into it. And uh, because this, this particular area was connected with a, uh, CDM or carbon market, and uh, one of the maybe the good things that I we all learned from the CDM is that the, is the, it's a bureaucratic, difficult, but it also ensures the projects are not failing and uh, not really going back to zero, but to keep progressing to make to get out of the, the system. Uh, in this process, uh, recently we made a carbon account. We have been making a carbon accounting year after year since 2009, but uh, in, in recently we had uh, some study on carbon sequestration potential, particularly the indigenous tree species of that particular area. So as you can see that the, the increment is uh, uh, progressing and accordingly the, the income coming to the, the, the community is progressing. So, so far the community has got about $1.6 million from the, the Kyoto market, uh, uh, the, the, the sequestered carbon sale and which was sold to World Bank in DC. Uh, and this is one of the things which has been uh, really uh, uh, I can say excellent incentive for the community to, to sustain the forest. And uh, this is going to continue, this project is going to continue up to 2036. And we are expecting that about 3.8 million or close to $4, four million dollar will be coming to the community. If the project continues sequestering about 880,000 tons of CO2 from the carbon market, this, that is only from the carbon market. Uh, there could be, uh, there will be a forest, uh, 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 the forest income, then forest income. So the other one was the uh, Sodo uh, a mountain. This is a VCS, uh, that voluntary carbon standard project, which is one of the water tower for that is a Sodo area. So it was degraded and the area used to have more than 15, perennial uh, water source, which has been dried because of the, the degradation, but uh, thanks to the re reforestation and the restoration activity we had, um, close to 12 waters uh, spring are come, uh, already come back. Not only the spring, also the downstream, which used to be, a, which has been affected by landslide and the runoff has now uh, recovered and the many of the system are back. So this is just a recent picture we had from one visitor in this August from that particular area. So overall, the, not only the water, the ecosystem, the biodiversity, as well as also the downstream uh, sustainable farming as uh, every part of the livelihood has come back. Specifically, uh, the, this project is put to 2006 to 2014. So it's uh, one of the long, time project for voluntary carbon market standard. And so far sequestered about 63,000 ton. And from this, sorry, can I go back? Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Cloud, can I go back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So far community has received about $100,000 uh, from the carbon market, which from the voluntary carbon standard. Yeah, and also one of the things which has been very impressed us is that the area, because of the degradation, the goiter, uh, goiter is a human disease which has been uh, prevalent to that area because of the degradation. 
now dramatically decreasing. So you can imagine that when we are restoring the landscape, we are restoring not only the productivity of the area, but also restoring the health of the, the human health as well. So uh, we are very proud of this, uh, this fact which is coming out of this project. Next, sir. So the next one is that instead, while we are restoring the uh, environment in reforestation, in Ethiopia, uh, close to 85% still the energy source is biomass. So without providing some complementary activity to, to at least to use less wood, it is still, uh, it's still challenging to keep on, uh, to make sure that the forest coverage is increasing. So one of the technology we, as a world vision uh, with the country government, we introduced the energy efficient cooking stove. You can see we call it that the three benefit or triple benefit of energy efficient cooking stove. Number one is environment, the other one is social, the other one, uh, the third one is also economical. So this stove, this one is a mobile stove. There is also another stove which is put for the uh, injera. So in those two stoves, there is a, it has been, they are approved for, to use from 30 to 60% less wood. That means that uh, when people are get ad adopting this energy efficient technology for the domestic use, that the, the, the pressure on, on biomass is decreasing, that gradually also helping the, to increase or to, to have more uh, biomass on the ground, as opposed to being cut for the uh, domestic use. Yeah, from the, this, this, this one, uh, particularly this is the, the injera one, the injera uh, cooking stove. So, so far as a world vision, we, just, we managed to access about 120, more than 120,000 energy efficient cooking stove as part of this project. There are different other, there are many other projects, but I'm focusing on this pilot project. So this, each and every energy efficient cooking stove is estimated to at least to, to save what, two tons of CO2 per year per store. So from this one, so far, the committee has got uh, 111,000, uh, uh, no, 247,000 dollars from the carbon market. In this case, it is only women who organized into this, pro as a, this project owner. So this is also another thing which has been helping the, the woman to, 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 to to get involved on the particularly energy efficient store, because instead of asking them to use this technology and the linking with the, this kind of incentive has been helping the, the, the woman. So how to reach to the carbon finance? Yeah, uh, at this stage, uh, it is not like, like 10 years ago in the global is a carbon market because of the uh, economic and the different fa fa uh, factors, including the Paris Agreement. But still, there are a number of doors over there. Number one, the important step is review carbon financing opportunities wherever it exists, identify fitting development challenges or the opportunities on the ground, identifying credible partners at the uh, global level, because this is not easy project to one organization or one country to implement because it needs different contributors from different angles. And then uh, identifying the project idea, not template, is to avoid doing something which is not really fitting to the, 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 the intended target. And the pre preparing the project idea, not get approval of, of the host country if needed. And the marketing the project idea, not. And the, once the project idea, not is marketed and uh, identified the, the potential by identified, proceeding to project design document and uh, taking a risk to invest upfront finance when there is no need, where there is no finance available. That's really one of the key areas. So that is in terms of the climate, particularly the carbon credit uh, element, but on sustainable development, particularly uh, with the uh, current, my award, uh, in Ethiopia, as I mentioned, that the landscape is highly undulating. And not only in Ethiopia, also in East Africa and in many parts of Africa, the, the topography is not really plain, uh, except some West African part. So, and the challenge on the ground is also not one challenge. There are too many challenges. 
And these too many challenges need sequencing the challenge and acting uh, according to the sequence. I, I, that's why we said uh, sequentially integrating and implementing. So instead of going one organization or one project with one item, another organization or another project with another item, and uh, at the end of the day, not fitting on the ground, the best way is sequ sequentially integrating the planning and implementation according to the cost, according to the context can really help to, to have sustainable uh, uh, arming on the ground and also make change. So in Ethiopia case, like uh, sub-watershed, let me finish this, this one, sir. Yeah, in Ethiopia case, sub-watershed uh, level, natural resource management is a key. Then it has to be followed by on farm water and the soil management, and that has to be followed with agriculture community production. And that has to be linked with an enhanced marketing and which has to be also linked with a financial service. And if these things are flowing according to the, con this may be not fitting to everyone, but in the Ethiopia, the, the, the landscape approach of the, the system of the Ethiopia system, this one, one more or less working very well. And we proved from this process, doubling agriculture productivity per unit area in less than four years became possible. Thank you. Next one. Yeah, the next one is as this, what I said in the sequential integration that the, you can imagine that the, the, first, the first on the left slide is, uh, you can see the great degraded area and the effect of physical uh, soil and water conservation as well as also some pits for the plantation as well as also the protected area on the second slide to the right. And uh, that when that gets ready, the water recharge and the system coming to the normal, coming to the better stand, water usually come out and that water can be uh, from the shallow water or diversion from the irrigation can be connected with the production of that particular area. So in this one, we say that converting the wasteland into the productive land. The other critical area on, on, on landscape management, particularly in Ethiopia and in many parts of Africa is that livestock management. Livestock management is in many parts of Africa is free grazing. So which is also uh, not helping the livestock as well as also natural resource system. So which is very, very keen to integrate natural resource management, livestock management and the livelihood. Otherwise, sustaining the agriculture productivity and the economic, that will be a challenge. So with this, let me stop here. And this is what uh, the facilitator indicated that uh, it's not because of the carbon, but because of the uh, sequentially integrated uh, agriculture and the making change on the ground. We won, we won as an organization and as a, as a country, this is the 2020 Energy Global Award. Let me stop here and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Asefa. And again, congratulations to you and the organization for that uh, feat. Uh, well done. Uh, and kudos uh, to you as well. So uh, I would quickly, I think in the interest of time, we are really running behind time. I would like to call um, Dr. Monica to please come through with your presentation. I had already introduced you. If you can just fall right in, that would be uh, commendable. Over to you, Dr. Angich. Thank you so much, Angit. I think I've sent the, the presentation to Dorothy. I hope she can share. Okay, my name as introduced is Monica. I am the Environment and Climate Change Advisor for V Agroforestry. Uh, we are working, you can go to the next, Dorothy. Uh, we are working in the four countries of East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And, uh, Today, I'm going to talk about the environment, the nexus between environment and poverty. And we just want to bring our experience as VI agroforestry on our sustainable land management uh, practices. So we are an development uh, organization that works to fight poverty and obviously to improve the environment. And our core business is tree planting. So we basically, uh, work so much to make sure that we have as many trees as possible around uh, the areas that we work in. Uh, we promote this agroforestry uh, 
mostly in Kenya, we are doing it in the Lake Victoria Basin and of and uh, Italia Elia, Transoya, and of, obviously the other four countries, the other three countries. Uh, we plant tree and we promote it uh, within uh, the smallholder farmers and their organizations. Uh, we have some organizations that are, are arranged in terms of cooperatives, circles, and so we, we work with our smallholder uh, farmers through those organizations. Uh, can we go to the next? Uh, since I, I decided to speak about the poverty, we obviously know that uh, we, poverty and, and environment are interrelated. Uh, and obviously now we are talking about climate change, global warming and other issues, for example, the current pandemic that we are having, uh, the COVID-19, which is going to have, uh, or which is already having a lot of disruption uh, in the world. So in terms of vulnerability, we are working with the, house, the poor household uh, farmers, the smallholder farmers who are in these uh, vulnerable areas. Uh, we are utilizing what, what the farmers have, that is their small farms, because we work with farmers who have not more than one hectare of, of land. So basically the asset base is not as huge and, and therefore that's why we, we concentrate on the sustainable land management. The very simple and basic aspects uh, of uh, conservation agriculture is what we promote. Uh, we can go to the next. So some of our SALM models, that is the sustainable agricultural land management that we are promoting, uh, just like how we have been uh, told from Malawi. The nutrient management, uh, you realize that for us, uh, we take so much uh, pride and energy in uh, conservation agriculture. So we use the basic mulching, composting, for example. Uh, we also use uh, uh, other agronomic uh, practices. For example, the crop rotation, the green use of green manure inter, intercropping, and so on and so forth. So these are just the basic and very uh, easy ways of improving our soil uh, nutrients and also for soil uh, carbon sequestration. We go to the next. So today I'll speak about our alive program, which is basically the agroforestry for livelihood empowerment uh, program. It's a program that we have been implementing since 2017. Uh, it's coming to an end uh, next year. Uh, we are actually doing our evaluation. Uh, and in this program, we have targeted uh, 42 grassroots uh, farmer organizations and local NGOs uh, in the four countries of East Africa. Our objective is to create societal changes and enabling economic uh, empowerment for the smallholder family, uh, farmers and their families. Uh, in this case, we are promoting a market-led sustainable agriculture based on uh, agriculture, which is based on uh, agroforestry. And some of the things that we do is promotion of different uh, value chains. Uh, for example, we, we promote uh, uh, for uh, planting of four uh, trees, which uh, support uh, the farmers who are, who are having uh, livestock. Uh, for example, we have a project that we name uh, Shrubs for Change that we are implementing in the Western Kenya and in Malawi through our sister company or organization, uh, We Effect. Uh, we also uh, prioritize a uh, focus on women, children, and youth. Uh, in fact, uh, our most uh, uh, unique way is that we promote the, the right-based approach, human rights-based approach, and of course, uh, which is helping us to look at uh, these most vulnerable people in the society. Uh, the model we use is uh, we are implementing through the theory of change and of course the, the human rights-based approach for us to be able to, to promote uh, the SALM practices. Let's go on, Dorothy. Uh, the output from this program, uh, it is uh, we have uh, around 8 million trees already planted in the four countries, and we have reached to, uh, 170 uh, farmers and their families, uh, and they are already using and practicing the some practices. Next. Uh, some outputs is that we have increased the uptake, including the positive uh, leakage of some practices, 
we have these practices being um, emulated by people, by the uh, organizations and uh, uh, farmers who are not actually in our program. So we feel that there is positive uh, leakage of these farm practices. There is enhanced food security, uh, increased awareness on the role of women, youth and children on the sustainable farming practices. Uh, this is something that we really have worked on very well. Uh, we have increased the help the, the women to increase their voice. Uh, we have families now, they are able to even make joint decisions in how they are going to utilize their farm or how they are going to plan for the resources that they have. So we feel that this project has really worked well to increase uh, this awareness. Obviously, through the uh, okay challenges, it's okay. Uh, challenges that we have is uh, the institutional capacity building uh, development for the partners. Uh, you realize that you are working with the uh, farmer organizations, so there are some of those issues that come up uh, with these farmer organizations. Uh, for example, governance. We need them to be transparent. We need accountability. We have the succession issues. Uh, so those are some of the things that uh, we are, uh, which are. We are experiencing it is also time consuming because we have to give uh, extension services we also need to have uh, constant monitoring uh, that requires time uh, energy and of or another resources the gender issues continue to be a uh, challenge because uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, of gender-based violence, uh, for example, and uh, with this new COVID-19, uh, a lot has come up on gender-based uh, violence that uh, most uh, women are being affected uh, negatively on this. And our enabling factors, I had, as I had mentioned, is, is that we use a human rights-based approach uh, uh, process to create ownership and create strong collaboration with our partners and stakeholders. Uh, we use um, consensus building uh, with households and farmer organizations. And we also have uh, our projects. We always do or carry out an environmental social impact assessment uh, so that we are able to project uh, the impacts and uh, any other uh, aspect of environment and social aspects that need to be brought by our uh, programming. We also emphasize on transparency. We actually have an anti-corruption uh, policy, reporting yeah. policy uh, on how our partners sh uh, should report and how we should get uh, the flow of information. I think we had been told it was eight minutes. So I wanted really to be in within the eight minutes. <laughs> so I think, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dupsa Wangechi, for keeping time. Um, I do like the fact that you stuck to your minutes. We do appreciate that. And in the interest of time, I think there are quite a number of comments in the chat that I'll encourage you to look at. Let me quickly invite our last speaker, Dr. Pascal Kambuso, who is uh, from AgriMac Africa. Um, Dr. Pascal is a PhD from Michigan State University. He's equally a chartered engineer. Um, he's also a lecturer, a researcher, and a commercial farmer. Uh, he does bring to this conversation lots of expertise around mechanization and why uh, we cannot be able to achieve our approaches without advancing mechanization uh, to the equation. Uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, refer to your statement about uh, the project you worked on on sending a hole to the museums of Africa and how your expertise in mechanization will help us indeed send the holes to a museum. Uh, over to you, Dr. Pascal. Uh, thank you very much. So delighted to be able to address you and also a bit conscious that I'm the last speaker <laughs> and I hope uh, everyone will uh, stick around. I hope I'll keep it warm and, and nice, especially because I want to talk from the perspective of the, of the farmer. Uh, the voice of the farmer is here. I'm a good representative of them. And uh, uh, let me see. The African farmer, the one on the left, who we bring all manner of machines, who we bring all manner of technologies, do we understand the African farmer? I would like to ask. 
Does the African farmer understand us? We have been around for the last 30 years. We have been trying to promote agricultural mechanization for conservation agriculture. I think we have the unique offerings in terms of the what, why, and how. And I'll try and bring all that on board in this discussion. Cutting across representing the farmer and also bringing in my experiences in applied research, hoping that uh, others in this uh, forum like me feel like in Africa, sometimes it's, it's like the only thing going on as far as resources are concerned is research. Very little, in my opinion, is going to the right level. So, so do we have the solutions? Uh, the, the program, this, this is covering some of my presentation. I don't know how to, oh, I can remove it, can't I can't die. We, Are we, can, providing see, we can see it very well. We can, we can see your presentation. I'm, well. I'm the one who cannot see some of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, so anyway, uh, do we have the solutions? Exactly. Do farmers see, see, see us as people with just the jargon? Let me speak as a farmer. When you tell me conservation agriculture, what does it mean? How about climate smart agriculture? How about regenerative agriculture? How about sustainable intensification? Some years back, we were running a project with CIMIT uh, with money from Australia. And we had a, a project called Farm, Farm, Farm Mechanization and Conservation Agriculture for Sustainable Intensification, FACASI project. You can imagine we went to the farmers and they asked us, what is FACASI? We tell them, uh, never mind, it is about two wheel tractors and how to do it to do conservation agriculture using uh, you know, smaller power machines and that kind of thing. And really, we really need to be a bit conscious about how we are relating with these farmers that we so much love to help. Let's talk about scales that they have. Let's start talking more about productivity. Let's start talking more about pro 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 profitability. How we organize their social capital, how we bring scale. How we bring farm power. Farming is too hard. How we irrigate, how we bring resilience and, 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 and they, they, then the farmers begin to, to feel like we have something to offer. Having worked with farmers for so many years, I have, I have now come to believe that actually what, what they need more, more from us is time. They need our time. We are passing too quickly. And we are full of jargon and, and, uh, and, and projects and uh, short-term engagements that uh, don't seem to make a difference at the end of it all. I mean, I'm bearing in mind that this whole presentation is about uh, farmers, partners, uh, practices and choices. Farmers need our listening ears. We need to listen to farmers, ladies and gentlemen. They need service delivery. They need to, to be helped with bringing the youth to, to like agriculture. They need to understand their role as, as key players in that value chain. A lot of times we discuss and then take it to them other than involving them in the discussions. Accountable extension services, markets, sustained support. This sounds like uh, what Traun started with in terms of uh, 10 commandments. Is it not moving? <clears throat> I'm trying to get to the next slide. Okay. I want to give you two examples, two case examples, so that you really, I really bring this, this experience of farmers from the side of the farmers to, to perspective. The Mwereri Kilimoifadi Sako and the Kilimara Potato Growers Association. When we went to start our business, we went to an area where we had 30 years of experience, where we had done a lot of extension work from the NGO side of things. We set up a company with a mechanization service hub model of how we, if we bring machines near farmers, then they are going to come and ask for those services. Then we can serve them in an orderly way. Uh, when as, as this as this went on, 
we started finding that farmers are finding a place to meet, a place to come and meet other, other value chain players, a, come and, a, a place to come and make deals, a place to come and, and request mechanization services. And that is good. And the Mwerari Kilimo Ifadi Sako was formed by our efforts. They were beneficiaries of our first award-winning AgriMech Mechanization Service Hub. They helped us prove the concept of a mechanization hub. The hub succeeded because of the trust relations we had built with them over 20 years. AgriMech moved even further and many years ahead when we brought in a, a, a savings and credit expert called Hand in Hand to train our farmers in savings and growing uh, and growing that, meaning independence and sustenance started becoming in, started coming into our work. I'm bringing in the, the aspect of partnerships here and also bringing in others to what you are doing. Left to engineers, we will just run the machines. Left to the typical ma machinery service provider, they will just go plow the land, not care about the environment, not care about anything else, just make the money and go away. So it's about these partnerships, it's about building independence and sustenance around these farmers. So despite having everything in place, we went to a place where we knew we had uh, all that history where it would be accepted easily. We found out, however, in the, into three years, we were not making good money in terms of business. The work volumes in this area were not good enough and we had to relocate. Before we did that, we went and talked to the county government and told them, you know, if you guys supported us in this way and that way and that way, give us free, free plot, let's, let's, let's expand our model, we can stay here. But that didn't come through and we had to, to relocate. These are the realities of business on the ground. You may love farmers, the farmers may love you, but business sense needs to happen with both ways, with the farmers and with the service provider. Uh, Kirimara uh, Potato Growers Association is another, up the road from, from where, we, where we settled was this, was this other circle or association. These ones had a lot more history. They had, a, they had built up a lot more support systems around them. Uh, they, was, they, were, they had successful farmer businesses. They had better land uh, up, the, up the road. It, this, this, it becomes a, more a, a wheat uh, area as, as you go up the hills and, and so on. So they had formed uh, uh, partnerships with the, with the Sulaji Sako, which was even paying us, which was, which, which was ready to pay us in, when we, when, before as we serve the farmers so that they can collect money from, from the farmers at the time of paying them for the produce that they had already connected them to markets. These are the realities on the ground. We need partners like this. The Irish government came around and they helped them build a store. Um, there, there was a very able woman chair who was a daring of, the, of, the, of, the, of all, the, all the support systems there, including the National Potato Council of Kenya. Interesting they live, uh, experiences like uh, they were introduced to a, a new variety, a Dutch potato the Jerry variety, but the producer of the seed had actually messed and the seed didn't work. And, and, and in that area now, the entire Dutch potato uh, uh, seed program collapsed. So the, um, we were also, we came to them with, uh, in the partnership of a machinery dealer who was ready to, to fund the, 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 the process, uh, provide the machines on soft loan and all that. The, the leadership of this, uh, of this machinery dealers uh, company changed along the way. We planted the crop very well with the farmers demonstrating how, how, grow, how potato mechanization looks like into, into the time for healing up and coming to harvest. We found the machinery was no longer available because the, the owner of the company had changed and etc. These are the realities on the ground. So to bring some meaning to what, when we talk about uh, you know, uh, all the efforts that are needed to come together. Today, there is a, there is the, 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 the Kilimara Potato Growers Association continues to be, to, be, to be floated around as a very successful social capital and a financial capital model for, for, for other farmers in the country. 
But really, what I what we know on the ground is that this this is an organization that has okay lost a lot of steam because of a lot of failed efforts and the many things they wanted to do. <clears throat> so sometimes we think a, a farmers group is amazing, but is it is it making business? <clears throat> so this shows us bringing in machines for potato with a big team from the from the company that I talked about. Uh, bottom left here, we found that we didn't have a machine, a machine that could do manure spreading. The women had to do it. The, the Irish company had come in with, a, with, a, with this storage for potato. And to today, unless, unless I don't have the latest word, this, this store has not been used. That, this is four or five years later. Why? Because it was located in a public land uh, by mistake. Uh, and also, uh, when 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 uh, applied research is put in place, we find that farmers actually don't have enough potato to store. One season to another, it is all bought, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I guess this is the challenge I'm giving researchers: that uh, let's get on the ground, let's really understand the issues, let's research these kinds of uh, interventions. We have gone on to have uh, to to change systems where the the old way of doing things. Uh, where the machine would go come from the vendor and go to the finance, but the financier will get get a loan to the to the buyer and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. We brought in uh, the idea of assets leasing companies. We have brought in uh, technology support uh, with with uh, with a uh, with a trot trot tractor, hello tractor. We have tried both, and and this this uh, this, this remains work in progress. We now have the German machinery ring that has also come because of the attraction of the of of the of the model that we have and uh, we it, all this is work in progress but the fact that technology can come in and make a big difference make a lot of shortcuts in the exchanges between partners uh, in terms of uh, uh, having tractors that now have a gps on them they can, it can track the owners can track where the tractor is the the, uh, the the whole system becomes more dependable in terms of data generation the whole system becomes uh, more accountable, uh, people that are not farmers can now buy machines and put in the pool and, and, and that kind of thing. I can say more about that where, where if, if, uh, if, if time allows. So uh, in terms of uh, recommendations, this is my last slide. Uh, the, the new agricultural researcher needs to strive to listen and understand the farmer's needs. The farmer defined entry points. Let's, let's, let's interact with these farmers like equals. Let's, let's listen, let's do less research and more development, please. Or should I say more applied research? More resources need to go towards farmer empowerment and youth engagement uh, because somebody asked earlier, how do you get youth into, into these systems we are talking about, like the case of Malawi, it is mechanization that will do it. Youngsters want to, 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 to run machine. They, want, they need farming that is, that is lucrative, that is less work and less drudgery. And it, that's what mechanization is bringing into the, into the game. So, but let's raise the volume of the farmers. Let's, let's establish market pools. Once the, once, the, once the market is established, the rest of the value chain maybe, I think just shapes up. Uh, we, we, are, we are telling our German machinery ring colleagues, let's go to farmers with market, not with machines, but with market. It is in, uh, in delivering to that market that they will ask for our machines. If the volumes required, the consistency, the, the, uh, the productivity, et cetera, is, 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 is there, then it's going to talk. We have a lot to learn from Ethiopia. We've been doing some work recently in Ethiopia and they have a very elaborate government-led extension service. And uh, you know, in many other African countries, the structural adjustment programs killed the extension services. And I'm really saying, if we are going to make progress, we need to get back to, to, to not just leave it to Wangeshi and others in the NGO world and, and the World Vision and others. Let's, let's get private sector truly at the middle of things. Uh, climate smart agriculture and the COVID situation has taught us differently. It has taught us the agency to adopt technology, new ways of, inclusive, inclu uh, of, of doing business, inclusive models, new finance models, 
how to engage our development partners and policy level people. Uh, and I hope we are learning from that. The farming needs new partnership models. For example, the German machinery ring that, that, has, that has come to us. The model of farms uh, and, and uh, centers of excellence. I don't know why we expect agriculture to run without uh, hubs, without referral and troubleshooting centers, the way medicine or health sector works. Uh, we have a lot to learn from the milk sector or the dairy sector in this country, in Kenya. Uh, how, how, how these hubs or, or, or places where, where concentrated effort, you know, lands where, where we can get other, other value chain players being part of a, a, a bigger game that is market linked. Governments need to invest more in agriculture. And I, I would really suggest that governments do it smartly by establishing, for example, credit guarantees for, for, for private sector players. Banks and even like we discovered our, in our own experience, asset leasing companies, they are very risk averse. Uh, they still don't trust agriculture. It is very risky, not even with the advances we have had in insurance. Uh, governments need to stay away from offering direct services to farmers, please. And, uh, at, and, and uh, I know I'm biased, but we have to work in, in, under, under systems where we are generating mechanization business models. They are there, we are, we are operating in them, but let's enhance this. We have only 2.2 kilowatt kilowatts per hectare versus 2.5 kilowatts per hectare. That means we have very low productivity in this country in terms of labor and uh, human effort. And of course, uh, I, would, I would urge as Agra looks at the next phase of, 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 uh, of, of their, of their uh, contribution to really put mechanization at the center. I think, I think this is one area that, uh, that has been forgotten for a long time and that will make a very big difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pascal. Now you understand why you were the last but not least. So the intent was to bring the voice of the farmer at the center of the conversation. And I do think that you've done a fantastic job elevating those voices and reminding us that indeed farming is a business and it must be established with a market pool system uh, powered by mechanization. Thank you very much. I would like to request our panelists to put all their cameras on. I will give Telahun five minutes to tease out just one or two from each of you concluding comments. I've seen quite a lot of the questions in the chat have been answered and uh, to our audience, we will be sharing the presentations. Please look out uh, for at our website, uh, agra.org, but also follow our Twitter handles uh, for follow on confirmation and questions around some of the things that have come out of this web series. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Tilahun for five minutes, um, and then you will tease out to each of our panel members as we conclude uh, this fantastic web series. Thank you and over to you. Dr. Ahmed. Good, uh, thank you, Adi. Um, I'm alarmed, uh, really impressed by the content and the engagement of the presenters. Um, too much to, to digest, uh, but I just would, would like to pick a few things from uh, every contribution, um, uh, which is really very, very impressive. I think from the first contribution, uh, the, the wisdom from uh, the farmer, I cannot repeat it. I think he has done an excellent job um, uh, in sharing his insights with us. Um, but let me start with um, Funke, who really uh, shares you know, how resources can be recovered and reused, uh, particularly uh, in a situation where we are you know, in a drought prone situation, talking about you know, water scarcity. Still not using the available water, uh, waste water, and the available nutrients. Uh, and at the same time, governments are investing hugely in terms of you know, waste management in our cities. So, how can we you know, improve uh, urban, peri urban linkages, 
minimize cost risk and improve efficiency uh, and also benefit farmers, particularly urban, city urban farmers, women, uh, including through commercialization of products. That was really a very interesting lesson for all of us. Uh, Mr. Zerude, uh, very passionate about conservation agriculture and questioning really uh, some of the wisdom. And some of the traditionally we thought established technologies like ridging. Uh, I myself used to think, you know, ridging is good because you can capture water, uh, you can increase uh, infiltration and uh, minimize, uh, you know, soil losses. Uh, but his experience shows otherwise, including from the students I project you mentioned. Uh, but the most important that in comp I mean, not I, I capture from him, is really in terms of um, one, you know, moving out of projects. How do we, you know, projects come and go? Uh, and those which you think are adopted practices, when projects are, are gone, then they also go. So how do we make sure that the good practices in projects are sustained and taken to scale. Uh, that's where probably investment from the government um, and from the NGOs really should come. So really, so that good practices are not dying because of uh, you know, limited support to farmers. The other, uh, I think, important point I captured from him is the harmonizing uh, messages. Regardless of what, you know, if you keep you know, telling farmers five different types of recommendations coming from different angles, they get confused and they don't know which one to take and whom to believe. So really harmonizing messages and really uh, debating before even going to farmers and making sure that we have a consolidated message, uh, which is responsive to the system is very, very, very important. Uh, Dr. Asafa, I think uh, very interesting again, uh, you know, uh, lesson. How do you develop incentives for rehabilitating the graded land, you know, benefiting the ecosystem, but also bringing in immediate benefits, immediate incentives for farmers to sustainably manage their, their ecosystems. Um, and, uh, and the types of approaches and process we, we need to consider uh, in terms of land rehabilitation uh, and the type of, you know, accompanied technologies like cook stoves, you know, to, uh, you know, minimize deforestation and maximize productivity uh, and has an implication in terms of resource use, um, uh, savings, but also health, because, you know, women, uh, you know, are exposed to, to smoke, uh, to lung diseases because of, you know, this open fire. So that's really another very effective work. And uh, Monica, I also really, you know, appreciate the, the Alive project uh, and, and mainly I capture this, you know, the, the, the joint decision making by farmers. So, you know, you can encourage one farmer here, one farmer there, but uh, unless they come together and make decisions together, so that what one farmer is doing is affecting, you know, the neighboring farmer positively or negatively, uh, and, and making sure that, you know, they decide together um, on the landscapes, but also manage their, their landscapes together and put rules and regulations, uh, local rules and regulations to manage the resources. Um, and, and then, of course, supported by knowledge. Uh, it's a very important anti contribution for resource management. Pascal, very complex, uh, really, uh, contribution uh, coming from different angles. People I, I saw in the, um, in the chat really. Uh, what they like, who takes the who to the million. Uh, you know, we cannot transform African agriculture by who. Uh, and we talk about, you know, really productivity, you know, a labor productivity, land productivity mechanization should come in. And uh, I think it's a very, very important uh, contribution. Um, and uh, I also, you know, had uh, the researcher, only for researcher, you know, uh, research to move to development, to move, you know, forget the jargon and listen to the farmer and, and really, uh, you know, engage the farmer uh, uh, in decision making, but also not um uh, the right entry point uh, for farmer to, to decide. Um, but most importantly, you know, 
support businesses when businesses cannot survive, cannot support farmers unless, unless they are profitable. So getting local support, you know, you know, access to land, access to resources, access to uh, finance uh, uh, and, and linkages, uh, you know, from different angles is going to be very important. You mentioned the hollow tractor uh, component. Uh, and uh, and and then really uh, explicitly mentioned uh, the dairy sector, which is talking about you know lively transformation in Kenya to so the dairy sector, which uh, really has been working over other value chains. So I can bring it to agriculture, to mechanization, to the extension system. So very uh, really educative uh, contribution. Uh, I know it's much richer than this, but. Uh, for the benefit of time, I myself really am grateful that you have responded to my our request to come and join us in this uh, very important webinar to share your lessons, and uh, and we will continue uh, really interacting with you all. Uh, back to you, Adi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Telahun. I will quickly give one minute, exactly one minute to each of my panelists to give us their concluding remarks. Please, one minute. Let me start with the passionate Dr. Pascal. Um, they're, they're calling you someone who doesn't fear to bring candor to conversations. What is your parting shot? My parting shot is uh, I, have a, I have a lifetime commitment to change this sector in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. Um, I'm getting very, very frustrated. I have tried all kinds of ways. I've tried university lecturing. I've tried research. I've tried NGO. I'm now in private sector. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we either act on, on, uh, on, on the realities on the ground and, and, and tap into the resources that we have in terms of youth, in terms of beautiful land, in terms of uh, business models that are working. Uh, some of which we don't even know about because we are not talking enough to farmers, the people that are doing it. Let's 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 let private sector lead the way, and then everything else will fall in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pascal uh, Zwedi. One minute. What's your parting uh, shot? Yes, 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 yes. I, I think as you heard from my last words, is uh, I'm just concerned that. Uh, with you know having worked in the sector for many years, I see that uh, farmers and everybody else we still do stick to the same things that are not working. The environment is changing, the context are changing. I think it's very it's absurd for someone to keep on doing the same things. So for me, I think it's very important that we we adjust continuously. Even this these beautiful things or presentations we have seen these technologies. They could be relevant tomorrow, but once the context are changing tomorrow, we must also, accordingly, we must change. So that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Zwedi. Uh, Dr. Sefa, your one minute. Yeah, thank you very much. I, yeah, I, I think uh, forest, soil, water, these are the three fundamental resources on, on the surface, particularly for Africa. If we want to make change, I think we must make change on these areas to normal or at least to the threshold level. Otherwise, all over the world may be not be paying back. So with this, the, the, the climate is changing, politics is changing, finance is changing, market is changing, the appetite of use is changing. So I think the, the, the usual business way will not take us anywhere. So we need to uh, speed up, uh, not shortcut, but sustainable way, moving forward, engaging the use. Otherwise, honestly, we have no time. As the previous speaker said, I myself tried my best in Ethiopia and outside, but things are changing. And if we are not coping up, uh, not, not easy. The second point I want to highlight is that uh, cannot shut down Ethiopia or Kenya or Africa, we need to look down, look from community up to international level so that we need to start something uh, by knowing where we want to end. So for the sake of the project or for, for the sake of activity, which will not give us even the bread after tomorrow. So I'm, 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 so I'm pressing all of us, let's push forward and see the best yet to happen. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see uh, Dr. <laughs> Nderitu and uh, Dr. Kofi. So um, I don't see your picture cameras on. I will assume, um, oh, you're there, Dr. Wangichi. So please do your one minute. Quickly. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, for me, I think we should just go back to basics, like uh, we should just go back to zero tillage, uh, residue management. And above all, I want to insist that we should all keep on planting trees. With trees, there's so much benefit. So my message is, let's all plant trees. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kofi, are you there? Unfortunately, she moved to another okay. meeting. Okay, okay, great. So I think that really wraps up our session today and a hearing from uh, our panelists today and our keynote speaker would like to thank you very much. You're saying that uh, insanity is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. I think we must agree we are not insane. We are going to try and do things differently. I'm hearing we need to act now. Tomorrow is not there without the now. And I'm hearing that it's not business as usual, and therefore we must be able to move. What I'm hearing, ladies and gentlemen, is that we all seem to be on the same page. We've agreed that we must be able, and if I used uh, Mr. Wendell Berry's comment, is that a sustainable agriculture is one which depletes neither the people nor the land. And I think what we're trying to then say today is that we must have sustainable farming that speaks to the needs of the African uh, continent, but we must do it today. Thank you all very much to my colleagues who have been working behind the scenes to pull this series together. We have learned a lot, we have heard from you. And indeed, if I can re-echo uh, Dr. Pascal's comments, we must listen to the farmers. And I think they have spoken loud and clear and we will take their voices to action. Thank you, God bless, stay safe. Um, and until next time, we will reach out to you all on email, on our websites and on our Twitter handles. Thank you, it's au revoir oh, from here. If you can please put on your cameras so we can take the last picture. All of you on the call who are still on the call, please put on your cameras. Paul Seward, Aseta, thank you all guys for all the support. You could never have done it. Our guru, Angie, who's been managing the machines from behind, thank you so much. Uh, it's you. au revoir from us. Goodbye and stay safe. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you very much. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.